This is Dave Monk, your Prairie Monk, WEFT Champagne 90.1 on your FM dial. And this is the 28th, might be the 29th of uh, November. And uh, uh, we're recording remote for presentation on Sunday. And I'm pleased to do that because I can uh, check out some of the things that I do. And words that I say, uh, <clears throat> I would like to say something about weevils to start with. Well, perhaps first I ought to say something about Thanksgiving. And uh, it is a rather wonderful uh, uh, event, uh, a little bit criticized by uh, Native people who uh, regarded as a, a rogue event, but uh, people get together, speak to each other, people bring me food, uh, uh, Kathy Sender and, and uh, Glenn Martin came and I had a, a nice Thanksgiving meal and still remote and I'm uh, zooming from my office space. I had a little event that I thought was interesting. Uh, I pick seed at this time of the year and uh, baptism or uh, I'm forgetting its common name, but it uh, has big pods on it and, and it takes you time to I check the kind of yellow seeds that are inside that are stuck there. Uh, so you have to uh, make sure you're not sowing uh, five seeds at the one place. And that means you have to unshuck these uh, pods. It's a legume, so it's a legume pod. And uh, I noticed when I uh, dealt with unshucked ones, that there was a little insect uh, involved, about the size of a uh, small tick. And, and uh, that, that a little bit too small for me to see properly. I suspect it was a weevil because I could see this proboscis uh, sticking out from its head. Uh, so I took a photograph of it and you can enlarge your photograph, and sure enough, it was a, a weevil. Weevils are very common. They have a long snout, and they can uh, chew their way into a, a seed. Uh, they may stay outside. They may chew their way, way right into a seed and burrow it out from that uh, situation. The mouth parts are at the end of that uh, snout or proboscis. And uh, there are some antennae a little further back which uh, feel their way around. Uh, I grew up with a rather large weevil. It could be about an inch long, uh, but uh, they range. And they're one of the most common uh, insects in the, the world. And they can be uh, quite a challenge. Uh, uh, there's one that is, is famous in the U.S. Uh, it's a boll weevil. It gets into the boll, the seed head of cotton, and lives there and uh, uh, destroys the plant and, and destroys the crop. So uh, people watch for uh, weevils that might be introduced from other uh, countries, uh, other places. And, uh, I uh, left the weevils there because they're part of the uh, ecosystem. And when I plant these seeds, they will include uh, a few friendly weevils. Uh, 
it's it, it's it's nice to think about uh, an ecosystem rather than uh, just one organism and one plant uh, like cotton and one ball weevil it's we more and more are beginning to realize how much we are dependent on uh, interaction between ourselves and uh, the natural uh, environment but uh, we're part of the natural environment too and when we disturb it we sometimes augment an individual creature and that may have a ramifications down the line so it behooves us to know uh, a, a little bit about uh, each creature if we're dealing with a, a certain field we need the people who do research on that particular weevil and and that's a lifetime affair uh, if you settle as a natural history person on a particular uh, uh, insect uh, it may be uh, uh, led by the fact that it's causing uh, damage to a crop so sometimes the research is controlled by the uh, damage that might be uh, uh, incurred uh, so you're looking for a uh, way of eliminating the weevil or the insect that might be doing uh, damage to a, an economic crop. Or if it's rare, you, you might need to know its history. And uh, uh, so that's a lifetime job. But for someone who has to deal with uh, insecticides or, or other uh, ways of getting rid of a, an insect, those people also have to know something of the life history uh, where is the egg placed and oh, oh, does this have an, another uh, organism through which it moves and uh, uh, that that is also a lifetime uh, job and more and more uh, we're having to look at uh, ecosystems uh, like oceans and uh, determine whether we can take out whales or or uh, squid or uh, other organisms and not upset the overall balance of uh, ecology. Uh, okay, I want to do something about mussels. Uh, uh, mussels are bivalves they uh, have a shell that opens and they allow water to move through their uh, apparatus and, and it capture uh, small creatures like bacteria and, and uh, other organisms that are in the, uh, in usually in mud at the bottom of rivers the bottoms of rivers are rather uh, healthy in terms of the amount of food that is on the bottom. So you have a catfish and eels at the bottom and a number of <coughs> historic uh, uh, fish and other creatures are found in uh, a muddy situation. Uh, I grew up in a fairly fast moving stream uh, uh, but you could uh, walk in the water quite clear water and you could feel uh, the uh, muscle underneath you uh, and if you disturbed it it immediately shut uh, it has a uh, a way of walking through the mud and you can follow the tracks and uh, some of these tracks you can actually see uh, on Market Street just outside Weft a little bit to the north there's limestone with the tracks of uh, mussels that uh, wandered in this uh, 
limestone uh, many, many years ago. Uh, it has been interesting um, uh, uh, working with a, a book uh, that was uh, written by a guy named Madsen. And, uh, Mad Madsen uh, was located in the uh, Grafton area, Alton, down near um, uh, Mississippi, uh, where the, the Illinois River uh, meets the Mississippi. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he reports, interestingly, on mussels. And uh, he was on the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission. He, he knew the river rats. Uh, that's the name given to people who uh, get their living from the, the various rivers. And he spent enough time to know uh, and to record uh, in more or less in the vernacular, but he's also knowledgeable of the scientific base of these creatures. Uh, uh, early on, uh, I uh, encountered mussels which get to be rather big, about the size of your hand. And I found mussels that had holes in them that were drilled. <clears throat> they were used for uh, making buttons. You could do it out of... of uh, bone or other things, but early on it was used for buttons. And so various sizes of holes gave you various sizes of button. And uh, th there was a slight disadvantage in that the button was prone to, if you wash them, you might they might break down. So later on, the uh, button trade was replaced by glass buttons or by uh, plastic buttons, uh, often plastic buttons. And uh, so there was a trade in the, uh, uh, and I know that well, but I was surprised that, that it was not the meat that was being uh, uh, used if you uh, uh, have mussels in the east, uh, they're often used in uh, uh, for eating. Uh, uh, and as I read, I realized that it was the shell that was being utilized, uh, and uh, it would sell for a, a huge amount and. Uh, people would find it in the in the river uh, mud banks, and you would find it by uh, perhaps walking in the, in the area and feeling underneath. But that was a little dangerous because the edges of the mussels shell can be sharp, and uh, actually, when you get big valves in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, they can be enough to, to grab your leg. Uh, so, uh, but they're uh, often uh, uh, economically feasible, but also for those that are interested, aesthetically interesting, and they get uh, preserved. Sometimes the shells, the inside of the shells have a, a, a iridescence to them that's quite interesting. So uh, we had a, uh, someone who would come uh, to our place and off to sell us six inch size uh, mussels. Uh, the mussel trade fell off some, but in those mussels, if you irritate them in a place with a little piece of sand or a sand comes into their body and shell, 
then they uh, they, they, they sort of put a, a, a resistance around that, which is part of a, an, uh, 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 an opal-like uh, pearl. And so there was a, an era when uh, the button trade was gone, that there was a pearl trade. <laughs> and uh, that was quite big because those pearls were fairly rare. And if you were a dignified person that wanted to uh, say something about your status, uh, to have a necklace of uh, real pearls was, was quite a, a statement. Uh, gradually, it got known that you could you could infuse a little piece of sand or something that irritated the muscle, and it would grow pearls. So you had people harvesting pearls, and uh, so then you had uh, technology of how to get pearls. You could get from walking and finding them underfoot or following their their track in the mud uh, and, and finding them that way. Uh, or you could have a, a kind of a three-pronged hook uh, and you dragged it along and you could drag up uh, muscles. And sometimes they were very common. Uh, that could end up being a more motorized a collection with a number of, uh, an arm load of these sort of uh, collection devices. And then you'd lift it up with a small crane and you'd have all sorts of uh, creatures. And that unfortunately was, uh, led to heavy fishing. Uh, you got old and young and uh, it led to early, uh, uh, control of some of that sort of fishing. Uh, you had to have a, a board with uh, holes in it. Um, sometimes they were uh, bigger holes for species that were larger and smaller holes for species that when mature were smaller. Uh, and the inspectors could check you out for the size of what you were collecting. They didn't always throw the uh, small ones back. Uh, sometimes they were just dumped. Uh, but the, that got to be a, a pretty cruel procedure. Uh, it was not only on the main uh, river, the Illinois River, the Mississippi, the Missouri, uh, but it was also... Uh, uh, up on the, the little side channels. And uh, so people would go out early and uh, go shell hunting all day. And uh, those people were often highly educated in the nature of creatures. And they knew where to find certain varieties of of, uh, of shell, uh, and they were well named and uh, well recognized. Uh, after a while, uh, the, uh, the trade dropped off because people got to realize that they could create uh, a, a pearl. And uh, uh, but then uh, there was a different trade. It was where you uh, took that muscle and its, and its uh, muscle, its sort of whole facet, 
which allowed it to open and close its shell and to move water through it. Uh, it a little piece of that, if put into a, a, a muscle almost like a, an oyster farm, and you could create a, a rather unique uh, pearl. And some of them could be uh, baroque. That means it could, they could be varying in shape. Uh, for some people, the very circular uh, sort of build up almost like an onion. You gradually build it up and build it up and build it up. So a, a, a large pearl would be worth quite a lot of money. But the Baroque pearls got to be also uh, a fashion element because they were a different shape and sometimes different colors. And uh, so that became a, an industry of, of note. Uh, one of the problems that we have is that uh, we've been talking about the Illinois-Michigan Canal, the Hennepin Canal. And when you do that, you have dams that allow for shipping to have some sort of draft uh, to be able to move up a river. If you're in the Mississippi, you have uh, perhaps uh, as part of a hundred of these uh, locks and dams. And that takes away some of the character uh, of the uh, uh, the river. And uh, biologists have in recent times been doing quite a bit to uh, try and reestablish these areas and not have quite so many dams. And in some cases in the West, especially, they've been taking these dams out so that the river has its own flow and uh, it doesn't have backwaters that are uh, still. And, uh, there are more riffles and uh, the population of creatures that occupy those rivers are more natural. Uh, if we're not lucky, then the species have dropped off. Uh, they've gone extinct or near extinction. Uh, so one of the things that departments of conservation, Captains of natural resources have been doing is to recreate uh, areas alongside the rivers that are, are coming back to nature and waterways that uh, uh, make it possible for uh, mussels to survive. There are also people who collect mussels and they're probably best part of, I would think, uh, 70 odd species <clears throat> and, and you have to figure out where you're going to collect these uh, and uh, in recent times uh, the Sangamon River has been uh, devoid of some of these creatures and, and biologists uh, with the help of volunteers have been putting back these mussels <clears throat> and they uh, do survive and they do well. And that's if they're around to be collected. Uh, it's very difficult to balance the commercial nature of the lock and dam system uh, in, in benefit of the muscle. Uh, it, it's uh, you have to think about that. And so uh, John Madsen uh, was knowledgeable as a, a journalist and a writer, but he hobnobbed 
with the people who are involved. Uh, sometimes it is an embankment of meat that has been taken out of the shell. What do you do with that? What is the community that is uh, where the shells are, are bought and sold? Uh, uh, there is a local uh, system which uh, wants to be neat and tidy and not have the uh, the smell of of rotting meat uh, from the, the mussels. Uh, the other alternative is to be a little bit relaxed, like river rats, and uh, uh, know where things are and uh, communicate with each other. Uh, use uh, outdoor, out, uh, outside motors uh, uh, and uh, crews, and they, they very well know where to go and where to be and how to help each other out. Some of the <clears throat> bigger boats uh, are staffed with, with cranes, and, and even they have sometimes a problem in the middle of the, the water. And then you have to be harvesting your shells uh, in competition with uh, huge barge tows that uh, take up space and make ripples and tend to also erode some of the uh, surrounding uh, soil, which means that along with farmers, uh, there's uh, an input of silt. So you have more silt than the uh, mussel would really like. It goes from clear water to muddy water. So if you are a scuba diver and you're interested in uh, finding these creatures, you can walk the, uh, the mud, but uh, you have to know that it's, it's almost... Uh, so dark that you can't see your way around. Uh, uh, but it also uh, gets hold of the, the last nooks of, of mussels. Uh, there are commercial people that claim that it, uh, it, the mussels will regenerate, but it may take them 50 years to regenerate these mussels. Some of them have very long lives and so if you're expecting them to, to grow back in 50 years, you might be out of luck. Uh, the mussels that are in the lower Mississippi are different from the mussels that are in the upper Mississippi. And, uh, so there are people who become specialists that are commercial people or as, as distinct from the river rats. Every once in a while, the river rats do get together. Uh, they probably uh, uh, heavy drinkers uh, uh, and, and have a lifestyle that's different, but uh, uh, they know where uh, their uh, economics is and they can survive uh, with an alternate uh, lifestyle. So Madsen writes about this and interestingly his wife is a, an artist so she draws uh, in uh, high contrast uh, these events and it's very helpful that you actually see what uh, a three-pronged prong, uh, uh, harvester on the end of a willow branch that you drag uh, uh, through the mud uh, to collect your mussels. Uh, so that explanation is there. The the the, uh, uh, the different styles of mussels are also there in t in your imagination to some extent, uh, but. Uh, So the title of the book that I've been reading, and, and I've 
been visiting uh, the Illinois River and the Mississippi River to some extent. Not so much the Missouri, but the Missouri is very extensive. So at the upper reaches of it, it runs into the Rocky Mountains. And that uh, is is rather helpful because it's somewhat more preserved than uh, lower down. Uh, so this is John Madsen up the river with the people and wildlife of the upper Mississippi. And uh, it's good reading around your environment. I'm going to say something about the fish that occupy these rivers. Some of them are prehistoric. They barely have uh, any backbone. They're more like sharks, uh, but they bottom feed. And uh, they're very numerous throughout the world, but very much in danger because they uh, haven't evolved some of the protections that make it possible for um, fish to survive. Uh, uh, they may have a, a long snout and a low uh, volume of, of, or low mouth that, that more or less sucks up uh, the mud and separates it out. Uh, they, they may have even been big enough in the uh, in these rivers that they could grow to be eight foot long and perhaps as much as 300 feet, uh, 300 pounds in weight. And those uh, creatures could uh, upset a canoe and uh, Joliet when he was exploring I had an account like that and uh, a very big and very strong fish uh, that could probably uh, destroy a, a, a paperback canoe uh, with their power uh, not necessarily mean, uh, but uh, unintentionally, sometimes fish are, are curious about a, a strange object in the water. Uh, they're used to trees and snags that fall into the river, but uh, these are live creatures and they accumulate in, in certain places. <clears throat> when you have a, a dam or a waterfall, there is usually a, a heavy erosion hole where the waterfall um, gouges out the water. It can be sometimes 80 feet deep. And the uh, dam also brings food and uh, so it attracts a population of fish at those locations um, if you have a maintenance diver who dives down to uh, look at the, the piers and the, the structures of the dam uh, the engineers are very aware that this sort of thing happens and it can back up and undercut uh, a dam. Uh, so divers go down there, but they're not very happy when they go down there because uh, there's a range of creatures and uh, uh, they live off of each other sometimes. Some uh, uh, larger fish eat smaller fish and uh, so on ad infinitum. Uh, but some of them are quite bigger than a uh, normal human and uh, they can brush past you uh, sort of checking you out uh, but 
not necessarily uh, wanting to eat you, but there's always the possibility that uh, this is a dangerous situation. So divers are rather cautious of those uh, holes that are at the, uh, at the bottom end of a dam, or they're on the, the river past the dam, not in the dam, but past it. Uh, many fishermen go to those dams. If we're local on the Salt uh, Creek near to Clinton, near to Clinton Lake, there is a dam there and you will see a lot of people fishing at that location because there is food, there's disturbance, there's uh, population and uh, it, it's a good place to work. Uh, Some of those uh, creatures are uh, prehistoric, and it's too bad to lose them. And uh, sturgeon and, and others are there, and their habitats are removed, and that's what we have to be concerned about. If you go to uh, west of here to the Illinois River, there is a, uh, there's a, a restoration area that's doing very well, but it's fairly purposeful. You have to take the uh, uh, corn and soybeans off, and you have to take out the uh, uh, levee, which stops that area from being flooded. And you have to be patient to wait for many years till uh, you gradually see the uh, egrets. And uh, you know that if an egret is there, it's going to be looking for fish that are there and the fish are uh, working with microorganisms and, and uh, perhaps uh, feeding off uh, vegetation that's on the edge and having habitats for where their young evolve. Uh, uh, I, I think I um, want to say that uh, sometimes these fish are uh, harvested, not necessarily for their meat, but for their roe. And uh, so the eggs get to be popular and and that uh, allows for a river rat population uh, uh, that sells uh, the roe uh, and it, it, it sells expensively. Uh, in amongst all this, there are native populations that know how to use uh, this landscape. Uh, it's interesting that people, even though they're very aware of poison ivy, will be uh, f very pleased to find a, a place where poison ivy is not present. Sometimes there will be an element in the uh, material that's has salvaged that will be poisonous. And the native population has had enough association with that to, to know that and to know how to, to treat that uh, resource so that it can be utilized. Uh, When we channelize the river so that they're much straighter and the 
big curves are taken out. The goosenecks, uh, they become uh, backwaters that are, are blind. And when in drought, those backwaters dry up, some fish get to be uh, stuck in that particular place uh, to the extent that some of these larger fish, uh, young folk would try to ride them uh, cowboy style, uh, but uh, it doesn't always uh, work because some of these fish don't have the gills that and the um, scales that modern fish have and uh, so they, their skin is is slippery and I can remember my folk were folk from a, from a Sydney a, a city and they were, were not fishermen in their own right but we were at the foot of a, a large mountain and uh, when at flood time uh, the people coming through from uh, the west over the mountain and down the hill uh, could not get across the river and they would my father was a school teacher so uh, they would uh, stay in the school weather shed or with my people and uh, other people too and they would uh, know more about the landscape than you would expect uh, we had a Thistle Y Harris who was a botanist and she would find all sorts of things in the sclerophyll forest. Sclerophyll forest is a forest that is not necessarily a rainforest, but it's very near to a rainforest. And she would teach us uh, about plants that we didn't usually find. Uh, the, when you're nearer to the tropics, you, you, you get more species of plants and animals. Some of those people, were used to fishing. And if you uh, are aware of eels and catfish, uh, they can be very strong. And uh, uh, if you fish for them in a flood time, uh, it's hard to get hold of them because they chew your uh, line and uh, get away. So. Uh, I can remember the Solomon family coming and uh, they taught us how to put a little piece of nine inches of copper on the end adjacent to your hook so that you the, the creature couldn't bite its way out. Uh, but people didn't really like to eat uh, fish that weren't scaled. The uh, eels and the catfish uh, had a slimy skin. And uh, if you were going to uh, eat it, you also had to know how to fillet it. If you had an eel, you had to hang it up and, and cut uh, three rows of meat out and leave the, uh, the uh, skeleton there. And so people uh, didn't like to do that, but they knew that monks would eat catfish and eels. And so often we would be left with those creatures and we would enjoy them. They have a little bit of a flavor of the mud that they work with. And depending who you are, uh, you can uh, enjoy uh, catfish. Uh, catfish sells well in restaurants and uh, uh, eels are another story. They they have the capacity to, to live uh, across the land sometimes so they can go from one puddle to another whereas uh, most fish cannot do that. Uh, uh, right locally we have a little uh, stream that joins the Ambra. It's, it's near uh, the uh, university fire department and it, it had to be, that creek had to be uh, 
modified to allow a, a Windsor Road to go through and under the railroad line. And uh, in flood time, the carp can come up, uh, but when that flood retreats, the carp are left, and they might be two feet long, in the, the, the blocked area. And uh, they're not necessarily wonderful eating, but uh, uh, they can be captured, uh, sometimes almost by hand. Uh, uh, So growing up with fishing, we would have fishing poles that were more likely to, to catch perch and um, uh, trout and or fancy fish. And uh, so we would have poles and uh, wind up uh, fishing lines and go fishing uh, sometimes in uh, flood time and sometimes in the normal flow of the river you, you would get to know where the holes are you 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 used to don't exactly know the science of it but the river runs in the meanders and and the, where the meander cuts in on one side, the pond is deep. And so there are different fish there than on the other side, which is more a beach side. Uh, and that, that sort of, uh, if you manipulate that uh, curve and make it straight, it will never really uh, do uh, very well. It's uh, a, a, a you're you're monkeying with the river, and uh, so a, a channelized river like the Mississippi or the Illinois or the Missouri uh, channelized, so there's no none of these very big meanders, and that leaves nature out and. Uh, sometimes nature finds a way of living with it and may, may become uh, a, a danger. For instance, in the Illinois River, we have a, um, a carp which uh, is moving up the river and, and there's a great deal of fear uh, in the Great Lakes that the carp will start to occupy the Great Lakes and then be dominant and take out a whole bunch of other species. So uh, You have to think about the balance between transportation and uh, nature. Uh, We sometimes have the same problem with farming. Uh, the nature will fo follow contour uh, levels. Uh, in, in nature, you can see uh, where there's a contour and, and where the water runs off and where, where it is preserved so it can uh, run into the ground. Uh, uh, Sometimes uh, farmers can, if they have a large enough area, uh, put in a levee which tends to capture the water and save it for uh, the, the subsoil. Uh, but uh, in other places, we have a, a north, south, east, west plat, so most of the properties that are owned are square or rectilinear, and and it's not very easy to to put a contour across your property when the uh, neighbors to the east and the west are, are uh, on total cult cultivation, and 
so then you have to think about the erosion that results and uh, the society that we have has come from Europe uh, it can be French or German or uh, Scandinavian or English and it has been very oriented to uh, the utilization of the resources that they find whether that be minerals or or whether it be uh, rainforests uh, right at, at this time the Australians are having problems because there was uh, iron ore underneath the uh, the um, ground where there were archaeological drawings and spiritual uh, items that were important to our aboriginals. So do you let that happen or do you have a government that says we're going to fine you heavily for, for uh, doing this? Uh, part of Australia's uh, income has come from a, a broken hill propriety organization which is very large and is <clears throat> multinational uh, so what what do you do and how do you maintain the dignity of the aboriginals in the first place and the landscape that they uh, utilize and worship uh, uh, You heard a uh, alarm there. I'm trying to not speak too long, uh, uh, and and have to be cut off. So uh, I th think I want to say, this is a day, monk, your prairie monk. W A F T Champagne ninety point one on your FM dial, and we appreciate very much the opportunity to to talk about environmental issues and the wonder of the time that is uh, Thanksgiving when we thank those people who get involved in all manner of uh, <coughs> industries that are, uh, we have to think about. We even have to think about our university and how it works. It may be that if you uh, have a academia that is oriented to, to uh, uh, studies that are and researches that are, are very monodimensional, then we welcome the, uh, the like of the, uh, the uh, Beckman Institute, which encourages interdisciplinary study uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, the bringing together of very different people and topics that uh, um, uh, need group action. And so how do you uh, talk to an engineer about the biology or sociology is, is important. So you have to think about those uh, things and uh, uh, say thank you for what you have and be uh, genuine enough to save what you have sometimes with very little left our own county has very little prairie when it was uh, almost a hundred percent prairie just a few outliers of forest here and there but forests are more popular than prairie so how do you uh, stand in a county meeting and and say something on behalf of uh, a prairie plant which looks a little bit like weeds and so as you uh, move out of Thanksgiving era think about uh, what you might do to maintain your heritage uh, prairie so thank you WAFT Champagne 90.1 on your FM dial, and with a lot of help from uh, Bama Public Television, which uh, allows us to do this, and they distribute uh, our message.